These are a few comments from a questionnaire that was sent out to photographers who reported experiencing pain and discomfort while using the imaging equipment. Over the course of this presentation, I hope to establish whether using the imaging equipment increases the risk factors of developing musculoskeletal issues and also understand why this may happen. I would like to present the results from an audit we undertook that evaluated the risk factors that ophthalmic photographers may face of developing musculoskeletal issues from using the imaging equipment. To start with, I'm going to look at how this study came about, look at how musculoskeletal disorders are described and their possible causes. Go through a questionnaire we sent out to photographers who were experiencing pain from using the equipment followed by the results. I will then share what I discovered from looking at the working practices of the photographers in Oxford and a few recommendations for best working practices to reduce the risk of injury from using the equipment. Advances in camera technology have made imaging the retina an invaluable part of the patient's visit. And because of this, a high proportion require a scan and a photograph as part of their appointment. In 2004, the imaging department at Oxford photographed between 10 and 20 patients a day, documenting the back and front of the eye. The number of patients in Oxford that currently require imaging on an average day range between 150 and 200. With current staffing levels, this means the average time allocated to perform a scan and a photograph is 10 minutes, allowing the photographer five minutes for each procedure. This means the photographer has the maximum capacity to image around 45 patients a day. Recently, some of the imaging team had reported pain and discomfort while using the equipment, and I was interested in finding out whether this is related to the repetitive actions required when photographing a patient, the high procedure output, and if these reported symptoms were isolated to Oxford. I wanted to know whether the camera manufacturers produce recommendations for how the photographer should use the equipment and the only information I could find was for the positioning of the patient and how to obtain the best image. This was taken from the manual of our 50DX camera and I couldn't find anything specifically designed to illustrate the best working practices of the photographer. The closest recommendations I could find were the working with display screens equipment guidelines produced by the Health and Safety Executive. This was created to protect employees from any risk associated with computers and laptops. The guidelines state forearm should be approximately horizontal and that the user's eyes should be the same height as the top of the screen. This may be difficult to follow due to the setup of the imaging equipment. If we look at an example of a photographer performing an OCT and measure the angle of the forearm, and the eye line, we see that due to the nature of the setup and the way they are operating the camera, it's not possible to follow the HSC guidelines. This raises the question, would this posture increase the risk factors of injury? So what are musculoskeletal disorders? The NHS lists repetitive strain injury, or RSI, as a general term used to describe the pain felt in muscles, nerves and tendons caused by repetitive movement and overuse. There are certain areas that are thought to increase the risk of developing RSI, which include repetitive activities, performing a high intensity activity without a break, and poor posture that involves working in an awkward position. Symptoms of RSI can range from mild to severe and usually develop gradually and often include these sensations. RSI is also known as work-related upper limb disorder and mostly affects part of the upper body, such as the areas listed on the screen. The Health and Safety Executive lists upper limb disorders, or ULDs, as aches and pains in these areas. Working environments that may cause ULDs include assembly line work, work with computers where the task involves prolonged repetitive actions, particularly using the same hand or arm action uncomfortable or awkward working postures, and carrying out tasks for a long time 
without suitable brakes. Unison list work related upper limb disorders may be caused by performing repetitive tasks and can occur when the tendons, muscles, ligaments or nerves are damaged by repetitive movements carried out at the workplace. RSI can be caused by repetitive movements of the fingers, hands or arms over a period of time or in an awkward position. Common causes are working at a badly designed workstation that has not been adjusted for the individual, using equipment that is too heavy and doing a task that demands you to grip something or apply pressure for a long time. Also carrying out repetitive movements too fast or with too much force and doing the same task for a long time without a break. When I first looked into the definition of MSDs, I instantly noticed connections between the possible causes and my personal experience of using the imaging equipment. This led me to ask the following questions. As the NHS guidelines state repetitive activities and poor posture that involves working in an awkward position increase the risk of developing RSI, so do photographers perform repetitive actions while in an awkward position when imaging the retina? And as highlighted by the HSC as possible causes for upper limb disorders, does imaging the eye require repetitive work using the same hand or arm action? Unison also states common causes are working at a badly designed workstation that has not been adjusted for the individual. So when photographing patients, is the equipment and seating specifically adjusted for the individual's photographer? I wanted to understand whether there is a link between the use of the imaging equipment and the risk of developing MSDs and answer some of the questions raised in our research. So I created an advert requesting photographers who are experiencing discomfort when using the imaging equipment and asked them to get in touch. The advert was sent out to three imaging associations, the Institute of Medical Illustrators, the British Association of Retinal Screeners and the Ophthalmic Imaging Association. A questionnaire was then sent out to those who replied and the questions included were the age and gender of the photographer, the type of equipment that is used, and which camera is used most frequently, the number of years working in the role, the number of days a week using the imaging equipment, and the number of hours a day using the imaging equipment, whether the photographer is left or right-handed, and whether there are any previous health problems that are associated with RSI, whether they are previously contacted occupational health, the number of sick days leave due to RSI associated pain and rating the pain from 1 to 10. Diagrams were also included, one showing the palmar and dorsal aspect of the hand and one showing the posterior and anterior views of the body. This was included so the photographer could indicate the location of any pain. Additional information was requested via email to find out the average number of procedures the photographer carried out in a day also which hand operates the joystick of the camera and which side of the camera is the monitor located. By collecting this information, we hoped it would create a profile of the photographer and understand in more detail their working patterns. 30 photographers replied after seeing the advert and we received 22 completed questionnaires from people who are experiencing musculoskeletal problems. The average number of years the photographer has been working in the profession is 9.2, working an average of 7.1 hours a day, working 4.4 days a week, with the photographers identifying that they use seven different cameras. Out of the 22 responses, 10 operated the Heidelberg Spectralis, followed by six using the Topcon NW8, two used the Topcon Triton, and one for the Zeiss Cirrus Canon. Kawa and Topcon NW6S respectively. Most of the photographers who completed the questionnaire were female and the average age was 44. 21 were right-handed with one being left-handed. And when operating the camera, five used their left hand, 11 used their right hand, one used both, and one was not applicable due to the type of camera. 15 out of the 22, had previously contacted their trust's occupational health department due to health problems related to using the equipment. When we looked at the results where pain and discomfort was felt when using the image equipment, we found that 17 of the 22 had pain in the hand or wrist, 
followed by 11 of the 22 experiencing pain in the shoulder and neck. Three had pain in the back and two experienced discomfort in the arm. After the 17 people who experienced pain in their hands, five had symptoms unilaterally, six in their right hand and six in their left hand. 11 of the 22 experienced pain in their shoulders with three feeling discomfort in both shoulders, six in the right shoulder and two in the left shoulder. Out of the people who experienced discomfort in the neck, seven had symptoms on both sides, two had discomfort on the right and two on the left. The questionnaire asked photographers to rate the pain level with one being mild discomfort and 10 being very painful. And out of the 21 people who completed this section, one did not answer this question, the mean average for the level of pain experienced daily was 5.7. The total number of sick days that were taken due to health problems associated with RSI came to 204. The diagrams from the questionnaire were overlaid into a grid template and the areas where pain and discomfort were identified and marked. The numbers of marks per square were counted and colour coded to produce a heat map of the area where pain and discomfort was commonly felt, shown here in the warmer colours. Using the same technique with the results from the torso diagram, illustrated that pain and discomfort was felt on both sides of the shoulders and neck area. And finally, the average number of procedures carried out in a day was calculated at 47. This created a profile of the photographer's working habits and the results showed that the Heidelberg Spectralis was the most commonly used camera and the hands were identified as the most common area where pain and discomfort was felt. Neither left or right hand was identified as being more painful. And although the majority were right-handed, only 11 of the responders stated they used their right hand to control the camera joystick. The heat map showed an even distribution between left and right hand with the hottest areas being on the thumb and wrist area. So we can summarize that although most people use their right hand for controlling the camera joystick, the right hand wasn't identified as being more painful than the left. Does this suggest that the repetitive actions required to operate the joystick do not increase the risk factors of developing MSDs? We expected the right hand to score higher than the left as it's used more, and this suggests there may be other factors that we need to consider and what role does the other hand play when imaging a patient? If we look at the most commonly used modality, in this case the Heidelberg Spectralis, why do the majority use their left hand to operate the camera, even though they are right-handed? And why would the responders feel pain and discomfort in both hands, when the majority use one hand to move and operate the joystick? If we examine the results of the 10 people who use the Heidelberg, we see four responders experience pain in both hands, with five people experiencing discomfort in the left and one in the right hand. If we have a quick look at this video, which we'll feature later on, it might go some way to explain. The photographer is constantly using the right hand to control the mouse, touchscreen and camera focus dial, while the left hand controls the joystick. This could explain why the pain wasn't isolated to the hand that operates the joystick. Also, 11 of the 22 experienced pain in their shoulders, with three feeling discomfort in both shoulders, six in the right shoulder, and two in the left shoulder. This is reflected in the heat map results, with the right showing a slightly higher score. But why would the photographer experience great discomfort in the right shoulder? If we look at this video again, we can observe the right shoulder has a greater range of movement compared to the left, which is static. Could this be the cause for the higher score? 11 of the 22 responders experienced pain and discomfort in the neck. With seven having symptoms on both sides, two had discomfort on the right and two on the left side. The majority of cameras have screens to the right. And if the photographer is constantly turning their head to view the monitor to the right, would there be a greater risk of injury to the left side of the neck due to the extension of the neck muscles. We contacted the hospital's occupational health department to ask advice on whether, in their opinion, the imaging equipment may be linked to MSD injuries with the hope they can answer these questions. An ergonomist visited the imaging department and observed the photography team scanning patients. 
they identified these areas of concern. The head positioning while carrying out the tests, the photographer's seating, and the photographer's hand and wrist positioning when scanning patients. We then produce recommendations to help reduce any risks that were identified. A GoPro was attached to the ceiling to observe the head and body position of the photographer and on the back of the OCT camera to show the hand and wrist position when operating the equipment. We observed the photographers using the Heidelberg OCT scanner as this was the most common camera used by the responders. This bird's eye view allows us to evaluate the photographer's head and body position in relation to the camera and screen and helps us evaluate whether the photographer is working in an unnatural fixed position. The GoPro on the OCT camera allows us to view the photographer operating the camera joystick and observe the micro movements required to align the camera to the patient's eye. We were particularly interested in looking at the photographer's head rotation when scanning as this fixed awkward position may lead to the risk of injury over their career. The GoPro fix to the camera head also showed us how each photographer operates the camera and whether there are any differences in the way they obtain the images. Because of the lack of information that's available for best working practices on how the photographer should position themselves, they all use a slightly different technique. There are, however, similarities in the way each photographer sits and operates the camera. The head is always rotated to the right, and the majority use their right hand to control the joystick to position the scan and operate the touchscreen, mouse and focus dial with the left hand supporting the camera base. Another area of concern highlighted by the ergonomist was the photographer's seating. The photographer's seating included a variety of mixed office chairs. These were not supplied by the camera manufacturer or purchased with this specific intent for imaging. The photographers used different rooms and chairs during the day, depending on their availability. It was observed that the height and back support was not adjusted before each use. This could be due to the time constraints and the duration the photographer uses the chair. It was recommended that the photographers trial a saddle stool for a week and complete a questionnaire at the end of the trial evaluating its use. Four photographers completed the questionnaire and this showed that two photographers felt the chair was an improvement and would like to use it in the future when imaging patients. When asked whether they felt they benefited from using the saddle stool, two said yes, one said no, and one didn't answer. Two commented that it made them more aware of their posture. And this is illustrated in a photographic comparison, and it showed the neck and back position was straighter when using the saddle stool, which is the image on the right. Reviewing the position of the monitor was also recommended as the head rotation was felt to be high risk over time and may cause neck and shoulder pain. Out of the 22 people who completed the ergonomic evaluation questionnaire, 11 people experienced discomfort in the neck and shoulder area. The majority of imaging equipment uses an industry standard setup with the camera in front of the photographer and a screen positioned to the left or right. The Heidelberg Spectralis has a screen that is on a fixed stand and is to the right of the camera. This requires the photographer to rotate their head to the right for the duration of the scan. It was recommended that the screen should be moved to a more neutral position in front of the photographer. An adjustable monitor arm was suggested as this would enable the photographer to move the screen to a more neutral position. I contacted Heidelberg to check that the warranty would not be affected if the monitor was changed, and also the hospital clinical engineering department to evaluate the adjustable arm for any safety concerns. Heidelberg confirmed an adjustable arm had already been used at another site and changing the monitor stand did not affect the warranty. Clinical engineering assessed the adjustable arm and did not feel it posed any safety concerns. An adjustable monitor arm was then installed to the Heidelberg for one week, followed by a questionnaire for the photographers to complete to evaluate its use. 
seven photographers trialled the Heidelberg Spectralis OCT camera with the adjustable arm fitted. All seven thought it was an improvement over the standard fixed monitor and they all agreed they would prefer to use it when seeing patients. None of the seven felt the adjustable monitor arm impeded their role when imaging. One of the seven noticed discomfort when using the arm as they were unable to use the COVID-19 screen protector as it obscured the monitor. When asked whether they feel they benefited from the change in position, six chose yes, and one was impartial commenting one week was not enough time to make a judgment. A GoPro was used again to record the photographer, this time using the camera with the adjustable monitor arm. And this footage was compared alongside the footage of the fixed monitor to observe the differences in head positioning. There was a notable reduction in the amount of rotation the photographer used to view the adjustable monitor arm. And the feedback we received indicated that the photographers experienced less neck strain with reduced head rotation and with an overall improvement to their posture. And we wanted to calculate the difference in the head rotation using the adjustable monitor against the fixed screen. A line was overlaid showing the direction the head was looking and a line across the shoulders. And this allowed us to estimate the amount of rotation the photographer turned their head to be able to view the monitor. The degrees of all the participating photographer's head rotation was measured with an average of 45 degrees rotation for the fixed monitor and an average of 13 degrees rotation for the adjustable monitor. If we go back to the HSC slides, it lists possible causes of ULDs as uncomfortable or awkward working positions which is similar to the NHS guidelines on the possible causes of RSI. So this raised the question, would moving the monitor lower the risk factors of the photographer developing problems in the neck and shoulder over the course of their career? The final area that was identified was the repetitive movements of the wrist and hand. There are no recommendations for the correct way to operate the camera joystick with each person using a slightly different technique. We were concerned that the hand position and repetitive movements may increase the risk of injury over time. The results from the questionnaire showed the most identified area of pain is around the base of the thumb. A survey in 2012 of ophthalmologists and optometrists found that 17% of responders experienced hand or wrist pain. Similar results were found in a 2018 survey of MSK pain in ophthalmologists and optometrists. This showed 18% of responders had hand or wrist pain. In this survey, 85 out of the 166 responders listed slit lamp examination as the specific task most likely to contribute to their MSK pain. There are similarities between using a slit lamp and the imaging equipment. As the operator moves the joystick forwards, backwards, left and right, and rotates the joystick anti-clockwise and clockwise. We looked at the distance the slit lamp moves with a single revolution of the controller. We then reproduced this using an OCT camera and we found that each machine moved up or down five millimeter with a single rotation of the controller. This means they both require the same action when aligning the equipment to the eye. The average pupillary distance for an adult is 63 millimeters. And with the help of a physicist, we used a Newton meter to see if the forces are the same to move each piece of equipment laterally using the average pupillary distance as a baseline. The slit lamp measured 0 0.046 newtons and the OCT camera measured 0 0.078 newtons. The operator uses the same actions to control the OCT camera as the slit lamp directionally and with the controller rotation except using nearly twice the force to move between the eyes. And as seen in the results from the 2018 survey, 85 out of the 166 respondents listed slit lamp examination as the specific task most likely to contribute to their MSK pain. This raises the question, are photographers at a greater risk than ophthalmologists? 
because they have a higher procedure output and because the forces required to move the camera are greater. A paper on the prevalence of risk factors for MSK injuries related to endoscopy concluded that the higher number of procedures carried out and the more time doing endoscopy per week over the course of a career created a higher risk of work-related injuries. The precise thumb actions, awkward working positions and working patterns are similar to ophthalmic photographers and suggest that over time there are similar risks of developing MSK issues. As we can see from this comparison, the precise thumb actions of ophthalmic photographers are similar to endoscopy and suggest that over time there may be similar risks of association of developing MSK injuries. The paper concluded that the risk is heightened by the volume and length of procedures performed and several joint injury syndromes, endoscope's thumb or de Quivens, are common. De Quivens or endoscope thumb is a condition where there is irritation or inflammation at the tendon of the base of the thumb and problems often happen after prolonged repetitive activity which may irritate the tendons with pain and swelling over the thumb side of the wrist which may spread down the thumb into the forearm and pain is often worse with gripping and twisting movements. Using the same hand or action is thought to increase risk factors of developing ULDs and whether these repetitive actions are the direct cause of injuries reported by the responders is difficult to confirm. But we believe as seen with endoscopy, the more time performing OCTs per week over their career creates a higher risk of work-related injuries for photographers. After observing the practices of the photographers in Oxford and assessing the results from the ergonomic evaluation, we created these recommendations for reducing the risk factors for developing MSDs for photographers using the imaging equipment. Our first recommendation is that staff take part in training on MSK risks in the workplace and preventative strategies. This will hopefully allow them to identify any possible risks and change their work in practices. Our second recommendation is that the workplace be risk assessed with risks avoided or reduced where possible. The assessment should focus on the task, the equipment and the environment you work in. We would also like to see the manufacturers include seating as part of the package when purchasing a new camera. This will be something that will be used specifically with the equipment and we believe a saddle stool or the equivalent would improve the seating posture. We identified the monitor position as a potential risk and made simple changes which improved the photographer's working conditions. This is an option we would like to see implemented by the camera manufacturers as a simple change can significantly reduce the potential risks by reducing the photographer's head rotation. As seen in the trial in Oxford, all the photographers were in agreement and felt less strain on their neck. Because the procedures require a high level of wrist and thumb movement, it's important to be wrist aware. If the photographers are feeling any pain or discomfort, it's important to seek treatment and contact occupational health. And finally, I would be interested in seeing the camera manufacturers produce a best practice guidelines for the photographers to be included in training manuals. This would give guidelines on the best working practices and techniques for operating the camera to reduce any risks. There is one question that has arisen during the course of this research. Should there be a maximum number of procedures the photographer should carry out in a single day? The results from the ergonomic questionnaire showed that the average number of procedures carried out in a day was calculated at 47, roughly one procedure every 10 minutes. And this seems manageable and would allow breaks. But in a busy clinic, this often doesn't work out due to delays. This chart shows the timings from an average day in Oxford and illustrates how the patients arrive dilated ready for imaging in waves, not every 10 minutes. Would these batches where you are required to perform more than one procedure every 10 minutes increase the risk of injury? As we saw in this paper, the more time doing endoscopy per week over the course of a career created a higher risk of work-related injuries. And we've established there are similarities between endoscopy and imaging the eye, 
So should there be a limit to the number of procedures a photographer can carry out in a session to protect them from an increased risk of work-related injuries? We started off with the question, are photographers at risk from MSKs from using the equipment? And after looking at the questionnaire and the working practices of the photographers in Oxford, we concluded that over the career of a photographer, the risk of developing MSK related injury may be high when considering some of the factors we have looked at. It's my hope that this evaluation can reduce the risk of injury and increase awareness preventing the injuries that were highlighted by the photographers. I would like to thank Julie Kelly, Senior Occupational Health Physiotherapist in Oxford, for advice on ergonomic MSK issues and for supporting this project from the very start. I'd like to thank Lewis Smith and the photography team in Oxford for allowing me to observe their working practices and for their participation in the trials. And finally, I would like to thank everyone who got in touch and filled in the questionnaire. It was truly moving to hear about the life-changing health problems some people have encountered from using the equipment and I hope this project will raise awareness on MSK risks for photographers. If you would like to learn more on this project and read the paper which the presentation was based on, please scan in the QR code.